Hey, I'm Dr. Rob. Welcome to Biblical Genetics. On today's episode, we're going to be discussing how the butterfly got its stripes. I'm coming to you today actually from the shore of Puget Sound, which is right behind me, but it's been raining. In fact, it's been raining for the past six days since I've been here, and it's going to rain for the next three days. And I wanted to get some filming done, so I found this old railroad tunnel at this park down by DuPont, Washington. It's an amazing place. There's so much history here. There is history of the Hudson Bay Company here. There's Native American history here. There's DuPont history here. And there's Lewis and Clark history here. There's so much happening in this little teeny area. But I'm stuck in this little tunnel. It's very echoey. There's old railroad tracks here. There's lots of really beautiful graffiti on all over the walls. But I don't want to talk about that. I want to talk about butterflies because of a brand new study that just came out. And it's actually amazing in its revelatory power about what God created. The title of the paper coming from Mazu Vargas et al. Yeah, the year 2022. Deep Cis-Regulatory Homology of the Butterfly Wing Pattern Ground Plan. Yeah, can scientists even speak English? Let me unpack this for you. What they're doing is they're looking at the so-called junk DNA and finding out that the so-called junk DNA is intrinsically important for determining the spots and the colors and the patterns on butterfly wings. Interesting because those spots and colors and patterns are supposedly what defines species, and species is something very important to evolutionary theory. And what they're finding out is that the so-called junk DNA is not nearly as junky as they thought, and the junk DNA is driving the so-called species. The scientists were looking at a group of butterflies called the Nymphalaeidae. It's a group of about 6,000 species and includes many of the species you are familiar with, like the Heliconus species, or Heliconus genus, which is noted for its mimicry. The Morpho, the, the Monarch, the Painted Lady, the Question Mark Butterflies. These are all very famous butterflies, uh, very familiar in our gardens, in our parks, and flittering around in our fields and our forests. They're also called the Brush-Footed Butterflies. You know, scientists have known for a long time that many of these so-called species can hybridize. In fact, when you see two species ranges overlap, very often you'll find a zone of hybridization and gene flow from one species to another, which raises the question of what exactly is a species. And the fact that this is so complicated means there's not ever been an easy answer. This genetic study we're going to discuss helps us to understand that, but it's not super clear when you're just looking at the color patterns of the wings of the butterflies themselves. In fact, they've discovered extensive gene flow between all these different species complexes. One of them in particular, the Speyeria family of butterflies as well documented, but there are many other cases. I'll leave uh, links to one particular paper in the show notes, but there's many others for you to chase up if you want to get into this fascinating field of the genetics of butterflies. What the evolutionary scientists have been learning is that species are transitory, they're ephemeral. They can appear, they can disappear, they can morph, they can merge, they can split. In fact, from my perspective, species are just an outworking of the baromen, the created kind. Baromen is a, a creationist term that was invented from two Hebrew words that are found in the Bible, create and kind, bara min. The bara min is the unit of creation. And when God created the diverse organisms, that make up the different baromens and the diversity within each baromen, he put in there a large capacity for change, for adaptation, for morphing, for transmorgification over time. I wrote about this in my three-part article series on creation.com called Species Are Designed to Change and my four-part video series here on biblical genetics, Species Were Designed to Change. You can go look up those if you're interested. There's tons of information telling us how species change, how fast they change, and the fact that they were designed to change, and this new genetic study does exactly that. In the past, scientists realized that if you disable a gene called optics in a butterfly, the wings will be nothing but black. But if you remove the gene WNTA, you lose all the stripes. So we have blackness, we have stripes, we know these genes are acting together in complex ways to make butterfly wing color patterns. But then they took that and they brought it a step up. They were specifically looking for gene regulators in the junk DNA, that is the non-coding DNA, the DNA that doesn't make proteins, but as we now know, because junk DNA is often highly functional, there's a lot of aspects of the so-called junk DNA that influence genetic expression patterns. And so what they did is they're looking for um, places where the DNA would open up, 
during cellular division, developmental pathways, and all sorts of things. But the DNA would open up, and an open section of DNA means that there's an active element there, and it's probably influencing some gene somewhere in the genome. They identified 46 of these regulatory regions, and then they started one by one deleting them using the CRISPR-Cas9 system, which I also discussed in an earlier uh, episode of Biblical Genetics, the universal gene editing software that's been developed by Jennifer Doudna and others in the most amazing way. She won a Nobel Prize last year. There's lots of cool stuff happening with CRISPR. But what they did is they took CRISPR and they deactivated all these 56 regulatory elements one at a time in five different species from five different genera of the Nymphaleidae family. We're talking about the Gulf Fritillary, Agralis vanillae, the long-winged butterfly, Heliconius hymera, the common buckeye, Junonia Siena, I think that's how you pronounce it anyway. The Painted Lady, Vanessa Cardwi, I love that, the, the genus is named after a woman, Vanessa. Painted ladies are beautiful butterflies. And then the monarch, Danaeus Plexippus. And what they found out is that the first four species in that list have very common uh, gene regulatory networks. From those 56 regulatory elements, they share them all or almost all in very similar ways in common. And they concluded that this ancient so-called junk DNA is highly important for regulating that gene. Interesting. So ancient junk DNA, which should be deletable because it has no function, was never deleted. And it's similar, even though the junk DNA should be highly mutable because it has no function. How can they possibly call this junk DNA? This is not junk DNA. This is highly functional DNA. And the fact that it has maintained consistency throughout all these diverse butterfly species in its four different genera tells us this is created. This is important. This is something God put into the original created kind. But the monarchs were different. They used a completely different set of regulatory elements, telling us that probably the monarchs are a different created kind, and the other four species, the gulf fritillary, the long-winged butterfly, the common buckeye, and the painted lady, are probably in the same created kind. Interesting. Now, I wonder how much hybridization can happen amongst these genera. It wouldn't surprise me at all, but I'm unaware of it at the moment. I'm sure people are working on it. I'm sure there are butterfly enthusiasts out there who are crossing butterflies like crazy and maybe just hasn't made it its way into the scientific literature yet or onto Google or Wikipedia or something like that. There is tons of hybridization happening amongst crazy things. In fact, a science magazine, Elizabeth Panisi, is a comment. She always writes an editorial in Science Magazine. She wrote this article a couple years ago called Shaking Up the Tree of Life. And then she says, why are we only now discovering massive amounts of hybridization between species? And they had a picture on the cover of two butterfly species hybridizing. Well, Mr. Evolutionist, Mrs. Evolutionist, the reason you haven't discovered it until now is because your eyes have been shut. Because Darwin told you this species changed very slowly. Because he told you that natural selection is going to separate species into little groups and you wouldn't expect them to hybridize because the biological species definition of Ernst Meyer, another famous evolutionist, said that if two species can hybridize, they're the same species or two things can hybridize at the same species. So when you find things you call species, you would never expect them to hybridize. But many of them can because they're actually the same species. Or are they? No, they're the same created kind. Or are they? And Oh, it's confusing because the basic unit of creation is the created kind. Within that created kind, God could have created diverse, what we would call species, things that breed true to type, things that have characteristic patterns and behaviors. But over time, because they're in one created kind, many of the species can merge. They can split. They can morph. And what we see and all over the, the, the created world is a diverse, very uh, complex pattern of species. Their species interrelationships are notoriously difficult to untangle in many, many cases. In my specialty, corals and uh, coral reef genetics, the, the Acropora species in the Pacific, there are hundreds of them. Some of them can hybridize, some of them cannot. Some of them in one reef can hybridize, but another reef cannot. Sometimes you can take one coral from this reef and man, go to that reef and it can hybridize with another species, but it can't hybridize with its own individual on its own species on the same reef. It's so complex. This is God's created diversity. Species 
reflect the diversity in the Barrowman, the created unit. All of Darwin's evidences actually are creationist arguments once we realize that those species are within a Barrowman. Dr. Robert D. Reed is a curator of Lepidoptera at Cornell University. Lepidoptera, yeah, that's a scientific name for butterflies. He's the butterfly expert at Cornell. He's actually the last author, in other words, the most esteemed author on this paper. And he had this to say, we have progressively come to realize that most evolution occurs because of mutations in those non-coding regions. Excuse me? Evolution happens predominantly in the junk DNA? No, no one should ever use the words junk DNA, ancient and conserved and functional in the same sentence. And yet these evolutions are feeling free to do that because there's a big sea change happening in evolution right now. They're realizing that most of the things they said over the last hundred years are simply wrong. The complexity of the cell, the complexity of genetics is not what we expected. And it's certainly not what I was trained on in my undergraduate and even graduate years. Everything is changing. Everything is shifting under our feet. Life is phenomenally complex. The funny thing is that if life were simple, evolution might be possible. But the more complex life becomes, the less probable evolution is. And all we know today is that life is hyper complex. Therefore, evolution cannot possibly work. And these evolution discussing junk DNA and regulatory elements are only slowly coming to realize that much of what they thought was junk isn't. It's funny, this comes right on the heels of a LiveScience.com article called Dozens of Ancient Viruses Are, quote, Switched On, unquote, in Healthy Cells Throughout Our Bodies. They actually looked at so-called recent viruses that integrated into our genome, ones that aren't even found in chimpanzees. And I found out they're highly integrated and very functional, turning things on, turning things off, having profound influences on the human genome. These are not viruses. These are not infections. These are not mistakes. These are things that got engineered into the genome, but that'll be another subject for another day. For now, just take home the fact that butterflies are amazing, butterflies are beautiful, and butterfly species are very hard to define because the species is not the created unit. The Barrowman is. Thanks for listening. Before I go, I just wanna thank my supporters on patreon.com and buymeacoffee.com for your generous contributions that are helping me keep this show on the air and encouraging me to produce even more episodes. I wonder what I'm gonna think of next. We'll see, stay tuned. Thank you.